We no longer need the sacrifices of bulls and goats to remove abomination, to bring any bad omens from our lives. Jesus did it all. If you tell me whatever you tell me, and you cannot show it in the Bible, you have to go back to your own stuff, and you have to show your own craft, and you have to come up with your own ideas. I would rather believe the Bible than any man on the face of the earth. We are people of grace. Christ has died once and for all. Our sins have been wiped clean. We are forgiven people. Jesus died once. He experienced death for us once, that we don't have to taste death again. I want you to understand that the temple is not coming back. Yes, men can rebuild. The glory of God will never come back to a temple that is made by the hands of men. God has already done with that era. He has started a new covenant and this new covenant is an everlasting covenant. We are going to be uh, speaking on the second coming of Jesus Christ, the end times. But for most of today, I'm going to just be laying a foundation yeah, whether you have ever heard anything about the end times or not, I want you to know it's not complicated. We are going to talk about this. I know God is going to minister to your life. The issues of end times do not begin with the book of Revelation. They actually begin with one of the Old Testament prophets. His name is Daniel. Daniel, the prophet, is the custodian, is the person that was given the revelation of the end times and how things were going to transition in the days of the end. It's not John the Revelator, it came from Daniel. And all the fights and all the issues that the church has with uh, the understanding of end times actually come from the book of Daniel. And so I want to spend a chunk of my time today on Daniel chapter 9, and then after we discuss those 70 weeks, once you understand the 70 weeks, uh, I know that it will be easy for you to understand all the other things that pertain to the end times, the 70 weeks of Daniel. If you ever hear someone speak to you about the end times and they don't know anything about the 70 weeks, they probably don't know much of what they are saying. There are so many uh, popular views out there. There are so many uh, pastors and prophets and people that have written books, they have talked about the end times, and I, I'm, I don't subscribe to many of those because I subscribe to what the Bible teaches, and what you'll find is that at some point, popular opinions uh, digress and move away from the scriptures, and so I want us to focus a little bit today and spend a chunk of our time discussing uh, from Daniel chapter 9. If you have your Bible, please do open uh, from Daniel 9. Daniel 9, if you have your Bible, I want you to look at your Bible so that we are going to look at Daniel 9. I want to read from verse 1. I will not have it up there maybe, uh, but I know we have from verse 24. But from verse 1, I want us to uh, read from our own Bibles. The politics of our world today, before I read that, but the politics of our world today are actually governed by what people believe about the end times. The politics of this country here is governed a lot by what they believe Israel is going to be in the end time and what Israel, role Israel is going to play in the coming of the Messiah. Because of that belief, because a lot of people or pastors or ministers that have access in the ear of the kings of our world, because they believe Israel is the nation to look at, then Every nation makes themselves a friend of Israel. And when we make ourselves a friend of Israel, naturally we become an enemy of the Arab nations. And when that happens, then you can understand the conflicts of our world today. So the view that you take of these scriptures is very, very important. And I pray that there will be clear understanding. And I pray that we are going to stick in the Bible. And it will cut across some of the things that you believe. My intention is not to offend anyone. But also, I also know that uh, the truth sets us free. So let's read. In the ear of Darius, the son of Ahuslas, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans are the Babylonians. He says, in the first year of his reign, I, he says his name is Daniel. He says, I, Daniel, understood by the books, the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. 
Let us put a pause there for a second and look up here. Let me tell you what that is saying. This is the prophet Daniel, and he's writing and he's saying, I, Daniel. So he's the writer of that, and he's saying, I, Daniel, I had read the prophecies of an older prophet called Jeremiah. And in his prophecies, when I read his prophecies, I understood that he believed, this is what he believed, that 70 years are going to be the years of captivity. And when those 70 years are done, and when those 70 years of captivity are done, then Israel is going to go back to Jerusalem. So Daniel was reading, and he understood, and then when he counted the years, he knew that this was the time that those 70 years were ending. By this time, he was an older man, he was in his 80s, and he understood, well, this is the time that the captivity ends. And that is what he's writing for us here. This is what he's saying, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books, the number of years specified by the word of the Lord, through Jeremiah the prophet, that we would, he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. He says in verse 3, Then I set my face towards the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said. So he starts his prayer over there in verse 4. He's praying that God, you say 70 years, God, 70 years are done. God, release us from captivity. Let there be no delay. He's praying and he's talking to God and he continues to talk to God. And if you go all the way to verse 20, he continues. He says, now, while I was still speaking, praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man, or the angel, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering, and he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill and understanding. At the beginning of your supplication, the command went out, and I've come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. So he's uh, an angel was dispatched when he was in fasting and prayer. An angel was dispatched. This angel is a messenger from heaven. Whenever you see Gabriel, he has not come to fight. Gabriel comes to deliver messages. Gabriel came to deliver a message, and the message he's delivering here, he's saying, you are greatly beloved. I've come to give you understanding, and I want you to understand some things. So this is setting a stage for you to understand where this prophecy, all the speaking of Daniel is coming from. There are 24, he says here. This is a message of Gabriel. He says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. So that is for the people of Israel and for the city of Jerusalem, they are determined some 70 weeks. 70 weeks are determined. He says, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation of for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. He says, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. I want you to understand, if you are Daniel and you are listening to those words, you cannot zone out. You want to understand everything that is being said by this man that has been sent from heaven. What Gabriel had to say was so important that God had to send an angel from heaven to come and speak. It was so important, and I want you to understand what it is. And so he says here, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation, and he continues. Verse 25, he says, Know therefore and understand. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command, and the question you want to put there is what command? To restore, what the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, until Messiah the Prince, until Mes from the command to restore Jerusalem until Messiah that is Jesus, he says there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in trouble sometimes. So, please, this is where some people zone out, and they go to build in Africa, and some are building somewhere in Florida, some of their winter houses there. Please don't go there. This is important. Amen? 
Pay attention. This is not difficult to understand, easy to understand. There shall be seven weeks, then 62 weeks, and then he says the street shall be built. He says after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. The people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be a flood until the end of war. Desolations are determined. Verse 27. This is one of the most important verses for you to understand here. He says, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wings of abominations shall be one who makes desolation, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Now, there are people who interpret this to mean that there's going to be one person that is going to be the Antichrist, that is going to be the person who is make, coming to make a covenant with the children of Israel, and that covenant should last 70 years, seven years, but in the middle of the seven years, he's going to break the covenant and he's going to go into the temple, which by then is already rebuilt. He's going to go into the temple, go to the altar, the, you know, desecrate the altar and bring abomination on that altar. And then he's going to make an end to sacrifices and offerings and then the end shall come. So that is the theology that is very, very popular. And I'll tell you more about it because many people, that are listening to me, subscribe to that theology. Amen? Many people do subscribe to that theology because probably you hear it so many times and what you hear so many times ends up becoming what you believe. And I, I want to just show you what the scriptures say and I hope that these scriptures, as you embrace them, they are going to set you free. Amen? So this is a question that you want to ask. This is a question you want to ask. What does the scripture say? What did we just read? What does it say? Then the second question you want to ask is, what does that mean? So because we have read it, if we close the book and ask, put a million dollars here and say, tell us everything that the scripture says, that million dollars will be left here on the table. Because many times we want easy scriptures. I has not seen, ear has not heard the things, <laughs> neither has it entered the heart of man, the things that God has in store for us. We want to hear no weapon formed against us. Many of us embrace those very popular scriptures. When we read these things, many times we don't ask ourselves, what does it mean? What did Gabriel come from heaven to say? This is what he came here to say. And so what we are going to do is, this is just a, an exercise in language. Uh, what does he say here? Verse 24, what does verse 24 say? Verse 24 tells us, he says 70 weeks are determined for the people. So even if you don't understand what those, a week is, you know that there are 70 weeks determined. 70 weeks are determined. And so, and the way he says weeks, in the language they say seven of sevens. When he says 70 weeks, 70 weeks is 70 of sets, 70 sets of seven, 70 sets of seven, 70 weeks is 490, 490. So 490 is what is determined for the people of Israel, okay? He says uh, 70 weeks are determined, what for? Look what they are for. Number one is to do what? To finish the transgression. So he's saying, after 70 weeks, I'll be done. I'll deal with transgression. He says, number two, to make an end of sins. So in 70 weeks, I'm going to make an end of sins. I'm going to deal with the issue of sins once and for all. That is what he's saying there. Number three, what is that? The other thing, to make reconciliation for iniquity. He said, I'm not just going to deal with sin, but I'm going to make reconciliation with man. All the iniquity of man that has brought a gap between myself and man, I'm going to make reconciliation. Reconciliation for iniquity. He's saying, and to bring everlasting righteousness. He says, in 70 weeks, I'm going to bring everlasting righteousness. And he says, to seal up vision and prophecy that when 70 weeks are done, I'll have completed and fulfilled all prophecy and visions that were given about the Messiah. And he says, and, and then to anoint the most holy, to anoint the Messiah, the most holy, to anoint him, that is 70 weeks are given and 70 weeks are determined for that purpose. Amen? That's what the Bible says. 
It says that. Then in verse, that is in verse 24. In verse 25, let's see what it says in verse 25. So if your Bible, the Bible you have is your Bible, you probably are underlining all those things. So he says, continues to say, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So this is a statement. He's saying that when there is a proclamation, there's going to be a proclamation. And this proclamation is going to say, go and rebuild Jerusalem. When you hear that proclamation to build Jerusalem and the temple, there's going to be seven weeks and another 62 weeks. That is 69 weeks. Then Messiah is going to be declared at that time. So that's what he's saying. When the going forth of the command to the rebuilding of Jerusalem until the Messiah, there, is, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again, the wall that is around Jerusalem, even in troublesome times. Okay? Verse 26 will tell us a little bit more. If we go to, and after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. So 62 weeks, Messiah is cut off, but not for himself. The people of the prince will come, destroy the city and the sanctuary, that is the temple, and the end of it shall be a flood till the end of the world. Desolations are determined. And he goes to verse 27. This is, then shall, he shall confirm that he there is capital he. Many people will just put a, a small e and they will say the he there is the Antichrist. But I will say that he there is the Messiah we are talking about. Then he, the Messiah, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, that is seven years. But in the middle of the one week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, that is in three and a half years, an end to sacrifice. And on the wings of abomination shall be one who makes desolation, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Amen? I think we have read enough for one year. Don't you think? All that information is so much, it's enough for one year. And then he continues about the 70 weeks. Okay? When we are studying in Daniel 9, we are studying 533 BC. That is where Daniel sees the vision. Over there. I, I want you to understand that when Daniel is seeing this vision, it's more than 500 years before Jesus comes. 500 years. You see how accurate that prophecy was. It's not like the prophecies we are hearing nowadays. Everybody nowadays wants to prophesy. Every nowadays has a word from the Lord. They miss it. A lot of times because they have not heard from the Lord. This man here is a prophet. He is accurate to the day. He speaks 500 years and he says there's going to be a proclamation coming. When you hear the proclamation, I want you to understand the prophetic clock has begun. And from that year, you can count and accurately be able to identify the Messiah and the end of the times. And so that is where he begins. So when he sees the vision is 533 BC and then there's a proclamation. This proclamation here is given in 457 BC. I'll show you that in the scriptures. I'll take you there just now. I want you to understand that that proclamation is given at 457 BC. Then he speaks and he says, from that proclamation, there's a period of seven years. There's another period of 62 years. Why don't you just say 69 weeks? Why don't you just put 69 weeks? I don't know. In fact, I can explain from the end of the, those 62 weeks, but here between, none of us knows the Bible is quiet about why he says seven weeks and then 62 weeks. We are not told why. But he says them this way. There will be seven weeks, 62 weeks, and that is 69 weeks. He talks about the 69 weeks from the proclamation and also to that uh, point there, the advent of the Messiah, the Messiah being revealed, he says there's going to be those uh, 69 weeks. And then that begins, the last one week, the, 60, the 70th week begins there. And I want you to understand that the, a week there is standing for seven years. One week there is seven years. 
And so when you read seven weeks there, you are reading about 49 years. When you read 70 weeks, you are reading 490 years. Okay? So that's why 62 plus uh, 7 is 483 years. Those are the years that were, were there between the proclamation and the showing off of the Messiah. That is where, and that takes us all the way to 27 AD. I want you to understand that. Then there begins that one last week that is in red. It's in red because that is the most controversial week. And then we continue there. So... Does that make sense, or do we stop there? Some, some people are saying, I need water. I just need water. <laughs> you know, this is, <laughs> why, why don't we have a simpler message for the day? Now, if you always drink milk and porridge and all that, you'll never build muscle. Amen? And sometimes the things that we believe and confusions that we have and the fears that, you know, plague our lives all, all the time is because some of the foundational things are on the wrong platform. There are so many people who live in the, all their, their fear about the tribulation, about all the, uh, the end times, and they are taken advantage of by people because they have the wrong beliefs. And I want to us to go to the core and begin where it's right. This man had from God. Gabriel explained the beginnings. Gabriel tells the story, and he says, this is what is determined for my people, the prophetic week. So I let me just show you how to interpret scripture with scripture. Leviticus 25, verse 8. I want you to understand. He says, count of seven Sabbath years. Seven times seven years. So that the seven Sabbath years amounts to a period of 49 years. Do you see that? Seven Sabbath years. Seven times seven years. So that the seven Sabbath years amount to a period of 49 years. That shows you how God speaks prophetically. So when he says 70 weeks, he's talking about 490 years are determined for the favor of your children Israel. These are years of exclusive grace and favor given to God's people, Israel. Those are exclusive. Nobody at that time had the covenant, had the connection with God, had access to God like the children of Israel had. They were special. They were different. We Gentiles had no access to the Holy One. We had no access to come to God the Father. Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 4 to 6, he says, Then lie on your left side and put, a sin, uh, uh, and put the sin of the people of Israel upon yourself. You are to bear their sin for the number of days you lie on your side. I have assigned you the same number of days as the years of their sin. So for 390 days you will bear the sin of all the people. After you have finished this, lie down again and this time on your right side and bear the sin of the people of Judah. I have assigned 40 days a day for each year. So that's how God speaks to us prophetically. That's how when he says... Uh, there are 483 years, and then another one week, seven years. He's talk, talking about the years and using prophetic language to call them weeks, to call them weeks. So if you add seven plus uh, 62, you multiply by uh, seven, uh, what you'll find is that it's 483 years. We are just seven years shy of 490 years, and that brings us to, uh, that will bring us to back to the diagram that we had up there. If we bring up the diagram up there, I'll show you something. So this is what Daniel is saying. When you hear that proclamation there, you are going to count 483 years. And that will mark the beginning of the last seven years. And when that marks the beginning of the last seven years, there's something that will happen to the Messiah. When was Jesus born? How many know history? Jesus was born in 4 BC. 4 BC is when Christ was born. From 4 BC, if you add 30 years, it will bring you to 27. 27 AD. That is where Jesus was baptized. When Jesus was baptized in that year, he began his public ministry, which he did for three and a half years. The public ministry of Christ went for three and a half years, and that's why it goes to half of the last seven years. And he says at that point, he brings an end to sacrifices. 
He brings an end to sacrifices. That means he gives himself as a sin offering, and once and for all, the sacrifices of bulls and goats comes to an end. That means if you are still cutting, you know nowadays people that are well-educated, well-learned, with very wealthy, are wearing some traditional clothing and starting to cut goats in certain ways and pouring blood and talking about all this culture and, you know, Kikuyu, Kalenjin, Kamba culture, our own West African cultures. We are going back to those things, sacrifices, but the Bible here tells us that at that point, at that point, At the middle point of the seven years, he will bring an end to sacrifices that we no longer need the sacrifices of bulls and goats to remove abomination, to bring any bad omens from our lives. Jesus did it all. It was done once and for all. Amen. It was done once and for all. He's the one who brings an end to sacrifices. It's not some antichrist that is going to come. He brings an end to sacrifices because he gives the ultimate sacrifice that is enough and that satisfies God to a point that God raises him from the dead and brings him back and that shows that he is satisfied and sin is done with and transgression is done with and all manner of iniquity has been and there is reconciliation between God and man and that he does by dying on the cross for us. And that, is, that happens at the middle and the center point of seven years. That is where this happens. So we are in the 70 weeks of Daniel. And if you understand this, you'll know that the controversial view, and this is where I want you to pay attention. The controversial view, these people that preach that message uh, have a bigger name than I am. They have better TV shows. They have more diagrams. They have books. They have so much up behind their name. Some are older. Some are deep theologians. But there's nothing greater than the scriptures. If you tell me whatever you tell me, and you cannot show it in the Bible, you have to go back to your own stuff, and you have to show your own craft, and you have to come up with your own ideas. I would rather believe the Bible than any man on the face of the earth. This is what the Bible teaches, and I want to see you to see the other diagram, that the seven weeks follows, uh, followed by the 62 weeks, they are followed by the other seven weeks. Now, the controversial uh, message is, takes those seven years, you see, the seven years there in red, and they say that at the end, at the beginning of the last week, after the 69, 62 weeks, at the beginning of the last week, There is a pause in heaven. And so heaven takes a break for 2,000 years. So for 2,000 years, heaven does nothing. For 2,000 years, heaven is not involved. It will come back to be involved 2,000 years later. And this is where some people now started saying, no, that week is going to begin. And they will say a certain point. And they even say, now the Antichrist, who is coming to make a covenant with Israel, is going to show up in 1950. It was in 48 when Israel became a nation. And uh, so they started there. Then Kissinger, all these other people became the Antichrist, including Obama just the other day, including Putin, including some popes, Vicaras day. All of them were said to be the person, the man of iniquity who comes to make a covenant with Israel. And they push all these things 2,000 years later. And I want you to know that that week there is the controversy of the world in our day. This is where many people have built a theology that there is going to be another beginning of the seven weeks. It's going to come somewhere later, in past 2023, because it has not yet begun. When it begins, they say, when it begins, Israel is going to now come back and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And when the temple is rebuilt, sacrifices will begin. And then the Antichrist is going to show up. It's going to be revealed. And when the Antichrist is revealed, then the Antichrist is going to make a covenant with Israel and turn against them and start killing the children of Israel. And then there's going to be tribulation over all the earth and Christians are going to be persecuted everywhere. And they say that then the end shall come at that point because the Antichrist is going to go to the holy temple and go to the altar and cause abomination on the altar. But they say that is coming somewhere in the future and not now. Amen. So if I wanted to really be popular, if that was my goal, 
I will not preach the message I'm preaching. I'll preach the message that that is coming. I'm telling you, there are people who are going to really raise a lot of money, and that money will be to buy gold to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. There are people that are going to be so deceived because they want to raise money to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem because they don't have a basic understanding of that theology and they are going to shift and take all this whole week and take it to the end. But I want you to just listen to me. Listen to me and look at what the word of God says. The word of God says that there's going to be the seven weeks, no gap. There's going to be the 60 week, 62 weeks, no gap. And then there's going to be the last week. And the issue of the last week is described for us in the book of Daniel. How things are going to transpire in that week. And that week, I want you to know, is the week of the Messiah. The, um, the Messiah reaching and teaching and preaching to the Jews before the message transitions and goes to the Gentiles after the next three and a half years. Because it's three and a half years, then what happens? After Jesus is crucified, the ministry of Christ to the Jews continues, but it continues with the apostles. Continues with the apostles. And they continue preaching in Jerusalem without any Gentile being reached. At the end of the seven years, point of seven years, the next three and a half years, the seven years come to an end. At that point, the high priest himself, in the, in the speaking of the, the Stephen, the high priest himself stands up and he rejects the message. They shut their ears to the message. And they refuse the message of the Messiah. And when he does that, this message is now transitioning and going also to the Gentiles. It's not denied from the Jews. The Messianic Jews that were there at that time, they take the message of the gospel and they preach among the Jews, but they also take it to the Gentiles. The time of the 70 years of God's favor on Jews only has come to an end. And now it's also the time where Gentiles are included in the fold. And this begins in the house of Peter, in the house of Cornelius, where Peter goes in. And when he walks in, he starts sharing the message. People are filled in the Holy Spirit. And then the Gentiles are also included in the fold. Then when you read Acts chapter 9, you see Paul is now called, and he's called as an apostle to the Gentiles. And every time he tried to go to the Jews, they got a hold of him, and they put him in chains and delivered him back to the Gentiles so that he can take his message to the Gentiles where he was called. And so I want you to understand, there's a lot of confusion. There are a lot of books, a lot of TV shows, a lot of speakers and teachers that push that week to the end. And that is why they come with this theology of those who are going to be left behind. I hope you are not one of them. I'm not one of those that are going to be left behind. I am a New Testament believer. Amen? We are New Testament, New Covenant believers. This is what we were saying here with the grace message that we shared here three weeks ago. To the, the, the last three weeks. And this is what we were saying. We are people of grace. Christ has died once and for all. Our sins have been wiped clean. We are forgiven people. Jesus died once. He experienced death for us once. That we don't have to taste death again. We are people of grace. We are no longer going, we are not going back to giving of sacrifices and offerings. Because Christ said, I am going to destroy this house. It's going to be left desolate for you. It was, he said, I'm going to rebuild it again. And he said that I'm going to cause a new man, a new person. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. Gentiles are not rejected. Jews are not rejected. There's a way that has been made. And that way is for all. That all should come and be part of what Christ has called us to be. Amen. Amen. Let's give him a good hand. Amen. And amen. And amen. So the popular view says Israel becomes a nation, sacrifices begin, the Antichrist is revealed, he makes a treaty with Israel, halfway through he breaks the covenant, he sets up abomination of desolation, tribulations begin, he destroys the temple, and then there's the mark of the beast that is put all over, and then the rapture happens. The popular view puts the Antichrist as the one who puts an end to sacrifices, but I want you to know the end of the sacrifices is not the Antichrist, it's Christ himself. He puts an end because he fulfills 
all the promises, all the requirements that, were try, that they tried to fulfill with the goats, with the goats and the lambs. It's not 2,000 years later. He did put an end to them at that time. So the Bible teaches that there is no gap between the seven weeks and the 62 weeks, and the church is in agreement with that. We all agree that there's no gap. But they come and put a gap. Some people come and put a gap between there to make the message more exciting, more explosive. This, this, this one I'm preaching here is not exciting. People don't like this one. People like, how about, you know, COVID and, uh, and, uh, and the people receiving the mark of the beast? Because a lot of people actually believe that if you receive the vaccine, you have the mark. You remember those days? You remember those days? No, don't look at me like that. I know you remember. Some of you are sharing that you knew. And some of you, you are just thinking, is this, do I make my way right with God? Do I break that relationship with that, you know, with that person right now because Jesus is about to come back? Many people actually have been deceived to think that there is an anti, there's a man that is going to be revealed in the future and there's going to be other sacrifices that are coming up and Jerusalem is going to have another, uh, you know, time of sacrifices coming into the temple. But tell me, what do you really think about God? Is God that confused? How will God come and put an end, break that veil was there, the curtain that stood in the, and break it into two. And then rebuild that veil again. How does he give his son to give a final sacrifice and to put an end to the sacrifices of sheep and goat and then take us back there? That is not the gospel of Christ. That is not what Christ, it's not consistent with the gospel of Christ. And that's why it's good to go back to the 70 weeks and understand that the 70 weeks are set and those 70 weeks represent what I just showed you here. And this is the correct view here. And the correct view is that the 70, the, from 27 AD when Jesus was baptized, three and a half years he's crucified. Another three and a half years the message goes to all the Jews at that time. They reject the message. The message goes to the Gentiles and now it goes to the rest of the world. There is something people call the replacement theology where some people say that the Jews have been rejected by God now. They will never make it. They are not going to make it back. And that is not actually what is taught in the scriptures. The Jews have a way of coming to the Messiah. The Messiah came initially to them. They are still the custodians of the Holy Scriptures. They are still the custodians of the covenants of God. They are still the beginners even of the new covenant. So they are not rejected. They are not cut off. They are not rejected by God. I want you to understand. But God has made a way where any person, Jew or Gentile, can come and can come through the veil and be able to come right before the presence of God by the throne of grace and mercy and be able to receive grace and mercy for themselves. It's open for all. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's nothing like separation. That wall of separation has been broken down and a new covenant has been set because the Messiah came first to the Jew but also to the Gentile like we have seen in the scriptures. Amen. Daniel 9, 27, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. He says, he shall confirm a covenant for, for one week. In the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And so the he there is Jesus Christ himself. And I want you to understand that that has been said. What about the th next three and a half years? After he was crucified, uh, we know that it was the years where the gospel continued to be preached among the Jews before it went finally, in Acts chapter 10, it went finally to the Gentiles and the Gentiles started coming in. And when I say Gentiles, I'm talking about all of us. So when I say Gentiles, really, we are the ones that were not, unless you were really born Jews, I, I'm sorry if I, you were born a Jew. Were you born a Jew? Any, any one of us here was born Jewish? Jewish? If you are, then you know, I apologize. But if you are not, I want you to know Gentiles are you and I. 
We were the ones that were counted as not part of the commonwealth. We were not part of the covenants of God, but now we have been reconciled and we have been brought in. And this has started happening in uh, Acts chapter 10, and that is the end of the 70 weeks. Then after the 70 weeks, we begin now the ministry that was there until. So, and I'm going to talk about Matthew 23 and 24 where Jesus gives the prophecies of the end time. He says, at that time, two are going to be working together. One will be taken, one will be left. There's going to be so much tribulation of those days. And he talks about after the tribulation of those days, then the Son of Man will show up. And he talks about the desolation of that time. But I want you to mark the words that he said. He said at the end of uh, that uh, discourse, this is what he said. This generation shall not pass until all those things are fulfilled. Talks about that generation. A generation is 40 years. And so if you come from AD 30, add another 40 years, you come to AD 70 when Jerusalem is destroyed, when the temple is destroyed, and the fighting of that time is like a flood that he talks about. And so the prophecies culminate at 70 AD, and the end of that time has come to an end. So God is not bringing back a temple. If you are thinking that way, and if you are theologians that way, I want you to understand that the temple is not coming back. Yes, men can rebuild. The glory of God will never come back to a temple that is made by the hands of men. God has already done with that error. He has started a new covenant, and this new covenant is an everlasting covenant. The old one is obsolete. The new one has already been unveiled, and that's why Jesus came and died. There's no other sacrifice that is going to be given. We are people of a new covenant. The temple is not coming back with the sacrifices that were there because this is what God said at the, in, 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 through Jesus Christ in that discourse. This house, he calls it this house, is going to be left to you desolate. And I'm going to close there. I'm getting a little excited, but I'm going to close there. This is what he talks about when he talks about the temple. When God was in Mount Sinai, and he's there making a covenant with Israel. He married Israel at that time. He made a marriage covenant with Israel at that time. The marriage covenant he made with Israel was that he was going to be a husband to them. And at Mount Sinai, he told them, because I'm going to be your husband from now, I want you to have a house for me where I'll be sleeping. My house will always be there. And that was the purpose of the tabernacle. That was God's dwelling. So that whenever they were to rise up, Moses would rise up and say, Arise! And let your enemies be scattered. And they would blow the trumpet. And what happened? The cloud that lasted would rise up and would go before the children of Israel. Let the Lord arise and let his enemies be scattered. God that was dwelling among them would rise up and lead them in the way. And in the evening he would say, let him come and be gathered again with his people. And he would come back and rest upon the tent. And they would see the glory of God shining in the tent when they came back in the evening. He was their husband and the husband was always at home. The lights were on. His house was there because he was among his wife. That is the children of Israel. Israel adulterated itself with all the altars, with all the idols, and with all the things that Israel did. And so God, through the prophet, spoke and he said, I will divorce you. I will divorce you. You are not going to be my wife anymore. And when the divorce was declared, that's why he comes back. Because when they came into the land, they said he cannot live in the tent. Let's build a house for him. This is the house of Israel's husband. It was always the center of attraction in Israel. It was always the place because that's where the husband lived. So when he divorced them, he had to destroy the house. That's why he's saying, I am living, I am living, but my house, I'll destroy it. The glory will no longer be there. I have no house among you. And so he leaves. But he says, I'll rebuild it. And he rebuilds it by coming to dwell in our hearts. He has become our husband, and he rebuilds it, and he dwells inside of our lives. He has become our husband. That's why the church is Christ's bride. Amen? So that, that's the new covenant. The new covenant is thus. 
So when someone starts talking about the building of the temple and going back to sacrifices, you always should be suspect of that theology. It doesn't come from this book. This book, it has no confusion with it. The new covenant builds on the old, but it's a new covenant. The old is absolute. Those don't survive. There's no eclipse of the covenants. Those covenants live by themselves. The new covenant is perfect. Christ is the ratifier of that covenant. It's one-sided. The other one, Israel had to commit himself that we are going to keep the words of the covenant. This one, nobody commits himself. Christ committed himself. He said, I will die. He ratifies the covenant between him and the Father. So when we come to Christ, we come into that covenant that was made between him and the Father. And I want you to understand that this is our belief. We are believers. We are not second class citizens to any Jew, to any person, to any Gentile, to any bishop, to any Pope. We are not second class. Before God, we are all the same. Purchased by his blood. We belong to the kingdom. I don't need other sacrifices to cleanse me or wash me from any sin. I don't need to go speak to a tribal elder. I don't need any help from any of them. Whatever the blood of Christ cannot cleanse, nothing will cleanse from my life. Yes. Amen. And so I want you to reject in your heart and in your mind that there is something else that needs to be offered for you. Freedom for your deliverance. The blood of Christ is enough. And I pray that God is going to help us as we study. You can tell I have a passion for this. And you don't know how much, you know, God had to restrain me and have, had to restrain myself not to say things the way I actually feel about them. Because sometimes you get angry with uh, people lying to God's people. You listen to them, they lie to God's people because they want to make a buck by selling a book or a cassette or something. But I want you to know that truth is here. There are 490 years that are set for God's people. Those are the weeks. That is how they are set. That is how it is. That brings us to Matthew 23, 24, and the book of Revelation, which are all together. We are going to talk about 666. And newsflash, it's not those you are thinking about. Amen? It's not a person you are thinking about. I want to uh, just to talk about that. One world currency, one world, those things that you are waiting for. If you are serving God, serve God now. If you are winning souls, win, win souls now. Don't think that, oh, I'll see. That's time then I'll commit myself for seven years. If you are committing yourself to God, this is the time. This is the time to give yourself wholly to the kingdom. This is the time to serve him. This is the time to do what you need to do for him. There's nothing, no other sign we are waiting for. Jesus Christ can come anytime, can show up anytime on the scene. This is the time to prepare to serve the Lord. When he said, I'm coming soon, he meant what he said. And let's bow our heads and pray so that we can finish off here. So, Father, we ask that in the name of Jesus, you that cleanses our hearts and washes our lives, that you'll watch the things that we believe, the confusions that are in our hearts. And Father, teach us the simplicity of the truth that is in the gospel of Christ. Our Father, our faith is not going to be built on things that are the ideas of men and the preferences of men that we are going to be built on the true word of God. Open our eyes to see prophecy, revelation, understanding, and to see how you have sealed up prophecy in the words you spoke to Daniel. And so we bow in your presence asking for wisdom, for help. If this is too difficult for any of us, King of Glory, make it simple and easy. Cause these discussions to be among us as we drive, as we speak on the phone, as we share. For mighty God, we are going to continue to deliberate on these things as you open up our hearts to them. And may these words prepare us to serve you better and to see the urgency in your coming and to cause us to fear, and to cause us to walk in the fear of the Lord. We give you praise. Maybe you are here among us, you have not known Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you want to do that today. Raise up your hand, please. I'll see that and I'll pray with you, wherever you are. You want to give your life to Jesus Christ, today is a good day. You don't have to come up here. I'll see you wherever you are and I'll pray for you, wherever you are. Maybe you have a need 
that you want us to pray for, just raise up your hand and I'll commit that, believing with you that God is going to move on your behalf. So our Heavenly Father, you've taught us to come and bring our needs, our cares and our concerns to you, and we do that now. We raise these hands to show our faith that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we may think or ask. You're able to do the impossible. That's why I ask that in Jesus' name, Father, you stretch your hand to meet the needs that are raised up to you here. We bring them to you because you are able. And Father, we bring them to you in faith. We believe, we know that you will do this. And we are grateful to you. So, Father, I pray that you meet every need. I come against the devil, every demonic force that is fighting against these brethren. I come against you, standing by the word of the Lord. In Jesus' name, I command you to seize your work in their lives and against them. I come against you now in Jesus' name and command you to seize. And so, Father, I declare that your freedom, answers, and testimonies are going to come from this prayer of faith. We are thanking you for what you have done, and we give you praise for it. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, believing and trusting. Amen and amen. May the Lord bless you.